Okay, welcome back to uh, session two of the water stream, day two. My name is Peter Cox and I'm a uh, director on the EOCP board. We're gonna welcome uh, Jeff Phillips back again. For those of you in session one, he's an old friend by now. He did a great presentation on the difference between DI and PVC restraints. Jeff's now gonna talk about uh, DI ductile iron fitting coating options. And for those of you who just joined us, uh, Jeff uh, has uh, 25 years experience in the business. He's worked as a consultant, a project engineer for pipe and fitting manufacturers and for fabrication companies. Um, he's also worked with industry associations and been involved in writing uh, bylaws, uh, handbooks, technical manuals. So Jeff is well versed in this topic and helped me in welcoming Jeff back to the podium. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Hello again. You're stuck with me for those of you who are here for first session. Um, again, Craig, our sales guy, is not here, so it, it's just me and all the new people welcome so what I'm gonna go over the it was supposed to be just on fitting coatings and stuff there's not that much to really talk about that so what I'm gonna do I'm gonna be talking about that but I'm also gonna be talking about the manufacture of the fittings how they're made because a lot of people don't know how ductile iron fittings are manufactured and all the steps that go into that and then the coatings that go on it after so I said, I'll talk about fitting basics of manufacturing, the available coatings that are out there. If you want me to get more in depth on any of them, just ask questions uh, at that time. And then zinc coatings, I'm gonna talk about that because that's a, it's not a new coating, but it's a newer one being used up around here. So I'm gonna talk about the different types of zinc coating you can put on, why one you might wanna use over another or why, why some places prefer one, one version over another. Unlike the last presentation, I've got nothing up here on here. I've got no, no gimmicks to play with, no 3D models. So it'll just be pictures on the screen over there that I can walk over there, but I go off the screen I found out. So if I point at the screen, you won't see me. So I'll just kind of point and you can imagine where I'm pointing. So first, there's three basic types of ductile iron fittings. There's a flange fitting, mechanical joint fitting, and a push on fitting. 90, 95% of the market is, for waterworks anyway, is mechanical joint fittings. Five to 10% is gonna be a push-on fitting, except up here, push-on fittings are more common. But most of North America, it's mechanical joint fittings. Flange fittings, every AWWA standard recommends flange fittings not be buried underground. And the reason is they don't have any flexibility in the joint. So ground tends to move, flange joints don't allow that movement, a mechanical joint or a push-on joint will allow for that movement. So that's why they're not there. Most of the applications for flange fittings are actually in industrial plants and stuff, or in, in vaults uh, for, uh, for waterworks. Occasionally they go underground, but as I said, not, not recommended. Two standards cover ductile iron fittings. C-153 is your compact fittings, and AWW C-110 is your full-bodied fittings. So the difference between the two, I'm pointing to the screen as you can see, um, C-110 fittings, larger fittings, thicker wall, uh, C-153 fittings, more compact, and thinner wall fittings. The reason for the difference is in the 50s, AWW C-110 was developed. It was developed based around the mechanical properties of cast iron pipe. Tensile strength of that, 25,000. So that's what that design was based on. And the wall thickness and, and just configuration was, was done on that. In the 80s, AWWAC-153 came out. AWWAC-153 was based on the properties of ductile iron. Tensile strength of 65,000 PSI. So the, the strength differential there allows for the thinner wall and the, the more compact fitting. Uh, again, 95% plus of the market is C-153 fittings. There's some holdouts out there still that are AWW C-110 fittings. C-110 fittings are made of ductile iron pipe, not cast iron pipe anymore. So it's way overkill. The thickness of a ductile iron C-153 fitting is still greater than that of the pipe. So it, there's really no worry if about normal corrosion in a normal environment. The coatings I'll talk about later deal with the corrosion part of it anyway. So, 
And with any luck, I think this presentation probably won't go the full half hour, so you'll get a little extra time for lunch. I might drag on, we'll see. So uh, fitting manufacturing process. It's different than making pipe. If you saw my last presentation, pipes made by pouring molten iron into a centrifugal mold, then annealing it in, a, in an oven. To make PVC fittings, you go through a couple steps. Melting, you gotta make the mold, you gotta make the core, deliver the iron, go through what a shake out, and I'll show you all these, grinding, and then, you, then the finishing process, which is your coating and everything else. And we're not continuing, there we go. So here's our electro furnace, we melt the iron in there, goes into the holding ladle. In the holding ladle, we may add some materials to it to get the ductile iron properties we want, make sure we got the little nodules, make sure it's actually ductile iron, not cast iron. And that, that's where all that is done at that, that stage. So really hot oven, melt the metal, you got nice liquid metal, don't put your finger in it in tech. It's like when they bring the plate at the restaurant, they say it's hot, don't touch. We really mean don't touch that. Mold making. This is an example of a, well, actually it's not. That's an example of one of the molds. We, we use that to make the impression in the green sand. This is called the drag. It's bottom half of the mold. Um, this is a pattern. It's not actually the cope. Cope is the top part. But uh, this is a pattern that we use in this mold. We put it in there. That yellow and white thing are called a core. I'm gonna talk about that in another two slides. So what those cores do, and in this slide it shows, is they fill up most of the cavity that that uh, mold put into this sand. This is just a green sand. It's very stiff. It holds its, uh, holds its shape once you, once you make it. The cores are actually made out of sand as well, and they hold their shape because of the additives that are put in there. So when you pour the iron, what the iron does is it fills in that gap that's left between the mold and the drag, and the cope is the top part, and the core. And then you can see there's a little extra grooves in the, in the sand there. What those grooves are, they actually, in the top part of that mold, in the, in the cope, they'll have outlets that lead into the fittings so that as that fitting cools, the metal shrinks, and this extra metal flows into there to fill up that void to make sure your fitting thickness is right. So I said, there's a pattern. That's what's used to drop that in. On that pattern, all the information you want to have is on there. It'll have the identification of the manufacturer, C-153 or C-110, depending which standard it's made to, what the pressure rating of it is, what type of bend it is. This is 12 inch 90. You'll have the country of origin. For us, we have foundries in both China and in the US, so it'll, it'll say China, US, uh, could say India. Those are your three major areas where, the, uh, where, where your foundries will be making fittings for, for North America. It'll have a foundry code and a date code. With all this information, if needed at any point down the line, you can always call us up and I don't know how long we keep the records, but you can get a CMTR, a chemical material or material test report, and it will just make sure that the QAQC was done right. So you can backdate and, and get the information. It's easier to, if you want a CMTR to ask for it at the beginning. But here's just a pattern shop, person making up the patterns. This is where the date code will be changed every time the new, new day starts. You're making 90 degree fittings again. You gotta put a new date code on there. All the other stuff stays pretty similar. Your date code is what's gonna change every time you have the production. Core making. I said the core is that part that fills the majority of the cavity in that mold in the sand there. This is at the plant um, after we bought it well, while they were still transitioning. We bought a plant down in Arkansas called Jensen Foundry. We renamed it Star Foundry uh, or SP Foundry. But they used to make stuff for agriculture and uh, airline industry and everything else down there. So this isn't actually a pipe fitting. So if you're trying to figure out where this goes in the waterworks industry, it didn't. It's just a picture I had. After the foundry was bought, 
there's a bunch of upgrades done to the foundry. I haven't been down there yet to get more nice pictures to go in this presentation because COVID hit and there's no chance I'm going to Arkansas right now. So <laughs> we, we will wait. In the future, you will have better pictures of that foundry when I can get down and get my own pictures to show. But again, you can see that this fills up the majority of the mold. After that, the cope goes on, which is the top of that mold, and then it's ready to pour the molten, molten iron in there. So here's your nice little carrying for your molten iron that came from the electro furnace. Bring it over. There's a hole. You could see it in the top corner there. I'd point to it, but again, you can't see where I'm pointing, so it's kind of pointless. Uh -huh. um, so you, you, uh, you pour it in that little hole. It goes in and fills, fills up the cavity that needs filling up. Then you wait. It goes down the line. It cools as it goes down the line. Then it goes into what's called the shakeout. The shakeout is literally just a machine that shakes this thing. What it does is it loosens up the sand that's in the, uh, in the core, and it loosens up the sand that's in the, the mold there. And it also knocks off all the runners and stuff that were the areas that that extra material sat in for it to go in when the, when the fitting cooled. And here's what it comes out raw. This is, looks a little worse than hopefully a standard fitting you'll get on site. It's a bare fitting. You can see that line in the middle. That line in the middle is just where the cope and the drag went together. And it's just like a, a seam along there. It's actually solid. You don't have a seam on the, on the pipe. It's just that little, little ridge that came out. But when it goes to grinding, they grind off a lot of that, clean it up, make it look nice. We actually have CNC machines down there that do a lot of the finishing work as well. This CNC machine, because it did work for the, uh, for the airline industry as well, is capable of half a mil, which is 0 .0005 inches of accuracy. Way more accurate than you need for the waterworks industry. For a 12 inch 90, I believe the plus minus on it is 0 .09 inches. So we're able to be hundreds of times more accurate than that. So it's just because the facility we bought had that overkill, but hey, it's nice to have. Here is the CNC machine again, just cleaning up where the gasket goes, cleaned up the groove on the top. Before finishing, after being machined, and we, we do, do nuts and bolts there as well. So you can make everything at the, at the foundry. And there you go, nice wedge bolts on one side, other bolts on the other side for the restraints. So we'll make restraints and fit and stuff. Here's the finishing. What she's doing there is that's a gasket that goes in the end of the MJ fitting and it covers the flange face of the MJ fitting as well as the gasket seating area. And it just protects it so when they put the cement mortar lining in there, it doesn't get behind the gasket and get in areas you don't want it to be in. So that's what she's dealing with there. She's either putting it in or taking it out, I'm not sure. But uh, that's what that's there for. This is a coating step. So the ones right beside the person in the white PPE there, which we all know way too much about PPE now, but this was done before everyone knew what those white jumpsuits were for. Um, those are the raw fittings. They've been treated and prepped and ready to be, be coated. And the ones away from there, the black ones, those have been put into a dip tank, and these ones were actually asphaltically coated. So your standard, your standard coating for, uh, for ductile iron fitting. So the available coatings, as I said, now we get into what the presentation was initially going to be on. Standard coatings for C-153 and C-110 are asphaltic. That's, that's your bread and butter. Most fittings that go in the ground will have an asphaltic coating put on it. That protects it and gives it its resistance to the corrosion. Other coatings that are available are zinc and FBE. Those are the two standard ones that are available as well. Uh, depending on the jurisdiction, uh, what, what they're going to want or if they want anything. The lining, standard lining, is going to be cement mortar lining or double cement mortar lining. Again, depends on the jurisdiction and what their requirements are. You can also get a, if, if you do a coating that's a fusion bonded epoxy, generally the inside is going to be fusion bonded epoxy as well. 
Uh, and then you can also do a P401 or a ceramic coating. Those are more common if you're going to be using them for a sewer application because they don't have an NSF 61 certification on them, so it can't be used in for a domestic water supply. But So for domestic water, it's going to be normally a cement mortar lining with an asphaltic coating or an FBE. You can, again, get them, whether it's through us or through other people, they'll come import or domestic. Again, import normally from China or India. Domestic is from US and I would like to say Canada, but there are no foundries left in Canada that make fittings that I'm aware of anyway. And the last one left, I was told, in the 80s. So it's been a while. Hardware, standard hardware supplied with this, with, with fittings that'll go out. Uh, normally it comes with a joint restraint that goes with it, but you can order the hardware. It's just gonna be a standard high strength, low alloy steel bolts. You can also get stainless steel 304 or 316 if you want, or blue coating. I said in our pre my previous presentation, we call it star blue. Other people call it other stuff, but it's a blue coating. It's a fluoropolymer and it's just a corrosion resistant. It also helps with lubrication of the bolts. And gaskets are SBR is your standard. You have other options depending where you're going in and what you need to. Um, you, you might want to switch out to a nitrile if you're going into uh, like a hydrocarbon contaminated area, but SBR will cover you for a majority of the places you're going into. It all depends on concentrations of stuff and everything. For flange fittings, the default coating is different than a uh, MJ or a push-on fitting. For flange fitting, the default coating is just a primer. Because, as I said, most of the time, flange fittings go into plants. The plants have special coatings that they're going to use depending on what they're putting through the pipe, uh, the temperature that they're operating at, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we generally will just supply a fitting either bare or more likely with a primer coating just to keep it from, from surface rusting. Uh, if people want, we can do a zinc or an FBE coating on it or a standard asphaltic coating. We can cement mortar line it. Again, most of the time, we won't cement mortar line a flange fitting unless someone asks us to because if it's being put in a process piping, cement might not be the best material for what's going through that pipe. So we'll leave that bare or primered a lot of time. Again, you can do an FBE or a P401 or ceramic or there's a multitude of, of other ones. It, once you get into the more exotics, we'll probably sub it out to someone else to do the, to do the more exotics. But those are ones we actually do in-house. Sourcing, again, import domestic, full face or ring. Here's pictures of your cement mortar lining. You can't tell it's cement mortar lined because it's all dipped in an asphaltic coating. So yeah, you just know when you're ordering a ductile iron fitting, it will have a cement mortar lining inside there, but it's black, so it's got that asphaltic coating. That's what gives it its uh, NSF 61 and stuff as well. P401, it'll be stenciled on the outside that it's a P401. Know that that's not for, for uh, sanitary, or for domestic, it's for sanitary. And then you got your epoxy coating, and as I said, generally your epoxy coating will be inside and outside. It, People have ordered it with cement mortar lining with asphaltic on the inside and epoxy on the outside before. Way more difficult to do. Why anyone would want that, don't know. Just epoxy inside and outside is more standard. Yeah, that was for your lining options. Your coating options, asphaltic coating, again, standard, unless you're talking flange fittings. Zinc, more newer. I'm going to, after this, the slides, I'm going to show you how zinc is done in the various methods of it a little bit, and then your standard FBE coating. Hardware, stainless steel 304, 316, the red nut and green nut tell you which one it is, the blue fluoropolymer, and just your standard HSLA bolts. Now zinc, different methods of coating with zinc. And zinc, is, as I said, zinc is getting more and more um, known here, it's been used throughout the world for a long time. But up in BC here, it's, it's starting to get more of a foothold. So the background, 
and the two approaches, and then I'm going to compare the two approaches in, in one slide at the end there. So the background was U.S. used polyethylene bagging. That was the uh, end all be all. That was your corrosion prevention. Europe, on the other hand, did some poly bagging, but they also were zinc coating their pipe. So one company in the U.S., Electro Steel, brought in zinc coated pipe from, or the technology from Europe, and that's how zinc coating got started in North America, was because Electro Steel brought it in. Most likely, I don't know, but most likely owned by a European company, and they thought, bring technology over. That's how it normally starts. So. Two, two different methods of doing it. ISO 8179, part one is arc spray, part two is zinc rich primer. Arc spray is what's used on pipe. It's a nice straight long run of, of uh, material, no contours, no anything to really deal with. Arc spray is great for zinc coating pipe. The other method, 81, ISO 8179 part two, is a zinc rich primer. It's just put on like you would put on any paint. For fittings, the zinc rich primer is the better, as far as anything I've read so far, um, in, except for people who only do arc spray, but for the non-biased reports I've read, the zinc rich primer is the better of the two options because it allows you to get in those contours and make sure your thickness is right. Regardless what method you use, you have the same amount of zinc protecting your fitting as the other one. It's just from a production point of view, I would go personally with the zinc rich primer. We, we do both because some jurisdictions require you to have arc spray, some jurisdictions don't care, other ones prefer you to have uh, the zinc rich primer. So depending on which jurisdiction it goes into, which method we use. If it doesn't matter, if the jurisdiction doesn't say, I will always push for the, uh, the zinc rich primer method. It's for fittings, as I said, as far as I'm concerned, it is the better of the two methods. Both will do, but. And there's not really a lot of studies out there on the two. So what STAR did is we took a simple fitting, a 12 inch blind flange. We coated one with the zinc rich primer, one with the arc spray zinc, and we sent it out to a third party to do a salt spray test. 504 hour salt spray test. You can see one's more corroded than the other. The arc spray got a little more corroded than the, than the uh, zinc rich primer. They both did the job. They'll both do the job in the ground, but it was just one way for us to, to know that the little bit of reading that was out there that we could do was right that for fittings, it is a better method, the uh, zinc rich primer. I said, both will do the trick. How can you tell your fitting is zinc coated? You can't unless it's stenciled on the outside because again, the zinc rich primer or arc spray, that's just a surface coating. On top of that coating to protect that zinc, you need to put another coating, whether that be your asphaltic coating, your FBE, or some other exotic that someone wants. But standard industry for waterworks is gonna be FBE or uh, more commonly just the asphaltic coating. So it will look identical to a standard fitting. It's the zinc that's stenciled on the outside or ZN that's stenciled on the outside that will let you know that is a zinc coated fitting. The first one there says a TN 9098. That's saying that it was done using the zinc rich primer. TN 9098 stands for Tenemic 9098, which is the manufacturer and which, which zinc rich primer was used. If it's an arc spray, it'll say zinc arc on it. Um, that's it, as I said. Pretty, pretty short, so I didn't quite probably hit the half hour, but you can enjoy lunch early. Um, any questions I can grab or? Yep. Thanks, Jeff, that was yeah. great. So uh, two questions. The first is uh, for the cement mortar lining, if it's cracked or broken, are there repair kits out there to repair it? Or do you it depends on the size of the crack. If the crack isn't too big, what the concrete will do is when it gets wet, it'll actually anneal and it'll, it'll heal itself. If the crack is 
is too big, and you'd, it all depends on the size of pipe, and there's a lot of stuff that goes in. So if it, if it is cracked, call me. I can let you know which way to do. There are repair kits out there. It's just go in with a trowel. It's not pretty, and you literally just fill in the gap. <laughs> so the other question is about uh, dissimilar metals with respect to stainless steel hardware. I know I've seen a lot of people use the stainless steel hardware, and then you dig the pipe up 10 years later, and you've now got accelerated corrosion. You've got a battery. With the, with the bolt hole, but the yep. stainless steel hardware is good. So yep. you mentioned stainless steel hardware. Where would you use it so that you don't set up that anode cathode type the, reaction? The, the problem is a lot. There's jurisdictions out there that will specify it, and you have to use it. Your best bet would be to put like a rubber grommeter, isolate it somehow. Right. To, yeah, uh, other than that, plastic sleeve or something, or, or, so or something to, to isolate it. Because other than that, you you've literally you created a battery. You got two different metals. That's what a battery is. Mm -hmm. You've got corrosion. So the places that hard spec it and say you need to have stainless steel haven't thought through the corrosion part of yeah, it. Right. They just think stainless better than not stainless. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would I would try isolating it somehow, or you could put a sacrificial zinc nut on the end. <laughs> they exist. There there's zinc caps that you get on every single bolt, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it exists. It can be done, but so your recommendation would be to go with similar type metals. Si similar and type metals because steel. Yeah, yeah, that'd be mine. And a lot of the time, ductile iron is going to be, uh, or the the joint could be denso taped. Um, and that'll protect it, or the poly wrap will, will do a certain degree of protection on it as well. Yeah. Great. So. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Jeff. Appreciate that. So, just a couple of things. Uh, the survey will be up later today, so please do that. And the award ceremony is at, at 12 30. So, uh, you've got a 45 minute lunch break, and then please join us at uh, 12 30 for the award ceremony. Thank you very much, and enjoy your lunch.